All right, so describe post-World War I issues in America and around the world. <clears throat> so, like the Spanish influenza we mentioned yesterday, and also, yes, the Red Scare, communism. So how many deaths came about from the Spanish flu? Communism. All right, what was the fear of the spread of communism? There you go, there you go. I did find a lot of communist articles in there, writings. Nope. Mandalorian, season three. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Caroline, why? Heard about this Friday. Bless you.
All right. Okay. So yesterday we talked about the Spanish influenza and the Spanish flu. Where did it actually start? Where did it come from? Connor, go ahead. Yeah, the United States, right? So this strand came from birds, right? Uh, and uh, with the Spanish flu, it's actually originated in the United States. So with Woodrow Wilson to try to build more of a military leading into World War One, he had to issue the what? What was it? To try to get more numbers going the military. It's like the Service Act, right? Yes. Okay. So with that, it's bringing uh, troops, young men, all around the country together in these small confined areas, these close quarters. And this is where this, this virus spread pretty quick, right? There's a lot of reports that even a lot of the troops from the United States died on the way to Europe. They didn't even get to the battlefield yet because of this virus, because of, they called it the Spanish flu. All right, so why didn't we hear about it, though? Why didn't we hear about it? Parker. Yeah, exactly right. So with the military, they're trying to really make sure that this word is spread. Okay, the virus or right? They wanted to make sure that this didn't get out to the public because this could cause a disruption to our involvement in the World War One. Again, as we're jumping into the conflict, this is our really our opportunity now to rise as a world power. So that's probably why you didn't hear too much about it. But why does it get the name the Spanish flu? Spanish influence, Chris. Yeah, good job, right? Spain was a neutral country, and they just reported it, right? They were writing about it in their newspapers, right? And explaining what type of virus this is, explaining that there's many people dying of this virus. So as U.S. troops get over to Europe in the trenches, we all know that trench lifestyle is terrible. It's brutal, right? There's low food, low water, right? You're, left, you're literally out in the elements, uh, day in and day out. So these immune systems were weak. And this is allowing the disease, the virus, right, to spread pretty quick, the Spanish flu. And we all know after the war, all these troops will return home. So spreading all around the world. So how many people died from the Spanish flu? Yeah, 50 million. This is double the amount of troops and soldiers that died in World War I. So this just goes to show what this virus, how impactful, how significant it really was. This was bigger than the Black Plague, the Black Death, right? Uh, when you compare it to COVID-19, obviously, it's a little bit different. And with the amount of deaths, there's a lot more. And maybe there's a lot of reasoning behind it. You know, when you look at technology, when, when you look at precautionary uh, standards, right? Uh, when it comes to maybe quarantining, masking, right? There's a lot of things that come into play here. So, Woodrow Wilson, what was his stance on expansion? Did he really come out and call this thing out for what it was? Did he stop industrial production? No, he did not. He just continued on. Again, this is an opportunity for the United States to rise as a world power. He's not going to try to hinder that. He's not going to try to stop it from, uh, you know, from the United States reaching that industrial level that ended up world power. So, also, we also mentioned that Woodrow Wilson was going through what? What was he going through towards the end of his presence? Connery. Uh, yeah, he had a stroke, right? So, his health condition was pretty, pretty bad. And when it came to just communicating, when it came to just addressing the nation, it was really tough for him to do. All right, so maybe that's why this got really out of control. Okay. But in any case, you can compare the Spanish influenza, especially when you look at how we try to prepare ourselves for a virus like this or a pandemic like this. And uh, really just when it comes to, when it comes to hygiene, right? When you, come, when you look at the lifestyles of the troops, the soldiers, the trenches, right? And how it was brutal and how this spread pretty quick. All right, so the Spanish flu. That poem yesterday, who read that? Connor, was that you? That was dope, man. Okay. Yeah, that was good. That was good. All right, okay. So we also talked about another virus. One a little bit more concerning. What was it? What? The color red. Okay, communism, right? Communism. All right, so uh, last week we talked about the Russian Revolution. We mentioned about Vladimir Lenin and how this Bolshevik uh, revolution inspired and started in Russia. They were all really pulled out of this war. And communism could spread to the democratic nations, these capitalist nations around the world. Obviously, one being the United States. And where you have government takeover, government control of all means of production, right? And uh, you'll have a classless society. So, yeah, this fear, this paranoia, this fear of communism spreading around the world, it was real. And you got to imagine, with all these immigrants coming into the United States after the war, 
a lot of them coming from Soviet Union, Russia, right? Uh, there's a real fear that this could spread and take down the United States. You might see rebellions and riots throughout all across the country. We talked about one unique example here. What was his name? Eugene Debs, right? He ran for president. How many votes did he receive in jail? How many votes? Park, remember? A million. Jeez, right? So you can see how this was concerning. How many political officials are like, whoa, geez, okay, many, so many people are buying in to this political ideology. This is crazy to think about. So, yeah, this was a true fear. All right, so we talked about the Espionage and Sedition Acts. We mentioned about how these bureaucracies, these government agencies were created to try to monitor, at the time, German spies and sympathizers. Then after the war, what else is now communism? So these government agents would spy in on people. Listen in their conversations, arrest people, right? And throw them in jail, and sometimes yeah. Oh boy. So, what's that story with Sasha and Vanzetti? What is this all about? These two Italian immigrants, okay, and their ideology is based off of this anarchical uh, ideology where they will just take out the government if it's not meeting the needs of the people. Looks a lot like communists, um, yes. So, there's murder, and uh, these two were accused of it. There really wasn't too much evidence behind it, but they were linked to the murder. And, well, they were placed in jail, they were killed, and this hit the newspapers all around the world. Okay, a lot of people were concerned by this. It's like, hey, people go to the United States for constitutional freedoms, for, uh, you know, the, these, uh, these, uh, these abilities to hear themselves out and have these liberties, have these freedoms. And it just kind of looks like we're just falling into this dictatorship in a way where we have government controlling the means, the ideologies of the people, okay, the theories, the political beliefs, right? And that's not what we're shaped to be. That's not what we're all about. So, yeah, that's concerning. That's something to know. All right, is there any questions here? The Spanish influenza, the Red Scare. Okay, here are your terms for today. So I do want to talk about Germany after World War One. okay? Leading up to World War II. So the next chapter, we're just going to jump right into it. As we can see, how this is going to be laid out. How this is going to lead to many of these extremists who rise to power. All right. So we got the Weimar Republic. Gustav Stressman. Whoa, what a name. The Dawes and Young Plan and the, uh, the uh, Kellogg Brand Act. Serial. Great. Oh, no, not that. Not that. Cool. You know how you did that thing for the 2020 graduates for the WWE thing? No, I don't remember this. No. For hours. Ah. It's going to be you versus the Red Scare. That would be good. For the title. That would be awesome. Quiet vocabulary. Censorship. That would be funny.
All right, so what do we got here? The Weimar Republic. What is it? What is it? What is it? So after World War One, do you think Germany's going to hold on to the Kaiser to this monarchy? No, they're not, right? They're going to try to embrace a democracy. And that's what the Weimar Republic is. It's a representative democracy where Germany's going to have elected officials that are going to meet the needs of the people, right? So no longer are they going to have a Kaiser or monarchy. Actually, Kaiser Wilhelm I, he'll be exiled to the Netherlands, to this estate, for the remainder of his life. And he'll actually die in 1941, which you'll actually see on somewhat of Hitler's role as his dictator of Germany. And he's not too happy about it, not too happy at all. And uh, there's a lot of stories about his concerns with Hitler and the direction of Germany after his takeover, which it's interesting, you know, interesting to talk about. So if you get a chance, maybe look into that a little bit more. The Weimar Republic, this was this government, this representative democracy that takes over of Germany after World War I. And as we get closer to World War II, it's not favored whatsoever. It's not favored at all. Okay, and one of the biggest issues is with hyperinflation. Right? But before we get to the 1930s, right, we got to first start with the 1920s. Right after World War I happens, Germany actually, actually goes through a uh, means of progress. Uh, a means of sustainability in the land, which is actually making life a little bit easier for the German people and accepting democracy as their form of government. So we'll talk about that here today. Gustav Stressman, he's going to be the guy that leads this role, right? He's going to be the foreign secretary, right? And establishing a means of economic uh, plans to try to help Germany alleviate a lot of the pressures from what the Treaty of Versailles, yes, good job. So Stressman, he is kind of this mastermind here that's leading Germany back to be recognized as a, a power that is uh, maybe as equal as the Allied powers, which is crazy to think about since this Treaty of Versailles burdened Germany after World War I. So he kind of goes along with the Allied powers in a way. He teases them. He goes along with their guidelines, their rules, and he makes life work. Right? And he actually makes a standard of living of the German people rise up. And he also pushes for moderation when it comes to politics, not allowing for these extreme values to come around, which pushes men like Hitler to the top, which we'll talk about. The Dawes and Young plan. We have here, Chris, go ahead. You talked about this the other day a little bit, didn't you? You mentioned it. They said about uh, means of repaint. Go ahead. Uh, it was a plan which um, basically after the German needs to pay a super store, it let them not have to pay as much as they were dead. Good. Germany reached uh, America and reached a couple of off their own. Yeah, good job, right? So, this is going to be really reliant on the United States to support Germany and repaying back its reparations, right? Towards the end of the 1920s, they're actually going to stretch out these reparations so that Germany doesn't have to repay them all at once. So, that allows for the German people to see a little bit more money in their pocket, allow them to maybe see a little bit higher of a standard of living. Right, and they stretch out all the way to 1988. Great stuff, right? Well, something just spoiled that plan. We all know that as Hitler's rise to power, where he's not going to pay any of these reparations back. But the Dawes and Young plan was a way for Germany to help Germany out when it comes to repayment and uh, repaying back these damages. Again, led by Stressman here, accepting these policies, accepting these plans. Extremist groups, like eventually we know the Nazis here the National Socialist Party, they'll look at this and say, how are we just following in line? Why are we just following what the Allied powers want us to do? So that's going to be something lingering in the background. But they still don't have popularity in people just yet. All right, the Kellogg Brand Act, uh, the pact here, this last pact here is uh, in the late 1920s, the Allied powers actually set Germany into the League of Nations. So the mid-1920s, right to the end of the 1920s, uh, they actually accept Germany in. And they have representation when it comes to determining talks and discussions at the international level. So this pact here, right, it looks like Germany now is seeing a seat at the table along with the Allied powers. So, you know, the long time coming, right, and after the Treaty of Versailles, it looked like things were just going to be, well, the Allied powers are just going to be embarrassing, humiliating Germany. But with this pact here, it allows Germany to have a seat at the table, right? Uh, down the road, we'll talk about We'll talk about it here. Hitler doesn't really care too much about this pact. He doesn't really care too much about discussing or co having conversations, diplomacy with the Allied powers. 
So he kind of just eliminates that pact. But for the Weimar Republic, this was a huge success. For Stresemann, this was a huge success. All right, so let's just talk about that real quick. So here's the Dawes and Young plan. All right, there's a picture of Stressman at the top, the Weimar Republic. I just put right there what we see with Germany's borders, what the country looks like right after World War I. Again, they lost a lot of territory. They lost a lot of borderlands here. But with Stressman, with the new German government here, the Weimar Republic, they're going to do what they can to try to build back stability and structure in Germany. And at the bottom here, there's a, this is just the agreement with the Allied powers and Germany to allow them to have a place to sit when it comes to the League of Nations, accepting them in to these negotiations and these talks. So there was a lot of progress throughout the 1920s. All right, so with the Dawes and Young plan, one thing to note with the United States, what do we know the 1920s as for the U.S.? What do we know it as? What's another name for that? Uh, not yet, right before it, right before it. So right after World War One, the United States goes through a boom, a huge boom at their time. Chris? No. Yeah, the Roaring Twenties. They call it the Roaring Twenties. I'm sure you maybe heard of that before. So as the U.S. is going through the Roaring Twenties, everything is great, everything is grand. They go through a lot of different uh, forms of luxury and lifestyle. It is meaning more of a modern twist, right, a modern style when it comes to an eight hour work day, right? 40 hours a week. And people have more time on their hands. They can afford many of these products that they really could never do, uh, never afford before. Again, this is because the United States is the only industrial power left after World War I. Also, like we mentioned, the European countries are dependent on US manufacturing. So when it comes to rebuilding Europe and helping Germany out and taking back these reparations, the US is really the only country that can do so. And that's obviously gonna only be set up more trading partners overseas and uh, really expanding our trade market or marketplace to Europe and really allowing the United States to rise even more as an industrial power after World War I. So the Dawson Young Plan, which was accepted by here Gustav Stressman of Germany, okay, he's realizing that we just can't scrap the Treaty of Versailles. We accepted it, it is what it is. We have to pay back these reparations. We had to give up some of these territories. So let's just try to avoid war at all costs, right? Okay, let's just try to accept what this democratic new form of government is going to be for the people of Germany, which is successful, right, for a short period of time. So real quick, with the Dawes plan. So the United States is going to loan money to Germany. So you can see that here with the Arabs. You guys get a chance to look at it in the presentation. So the United States is going to loan, let's say, $2.5 billion to Germany to rebuild. Right, so as Germany is rebuilding their infrastructure, as they're rebuilding their industries, their factories, whatever capital they make off of that, obviously they're gonna send a little bit of that to the Allied powers. They're gonna pay those reparations back. In other words, with the United States is funding. Okay, so as they are accepting this money in, Germany is going to use this money to pretty much rebuild their infrastructure, rebuild their factories and industries, and whatever kind of left over of uh, the profit from these industries, these factories, they're gonna send that to the Allied powers. In what? Reparations, right? We mentioned that with the Treaty of Versailles. So the Allied powers, especially France, what are they going to do with that money? Rebuild, right? They're going to have to rebuild. A lot of northern France is destroyed from trench warfare, from the war effects. Okay? Great Britain, obviously, they lost a generation of men, so they're going to use that to pump it in their infrastructure, too. So eventually, the Allied powers, well, they'll have to pay back the U.S. Because who was funding this war for the Allied powers for the majority of 1914 to 1918? United States, right? So you can see how this is just a big triangle effect, right? This works out again for a short time, six, seven, eight years, right? Until what happens in the United States? Matt, you said it earlier, the Great Depression, right? So eventually with this oversupply, and let's face it, do you think the Allied powers really pay back the United States right away? No, okay, there's just not enough coming in as we're kind of overstretching when it comes to industrial might. And we're adding to this oversupply, which means if you have an oversupply, the prices do what? They drop, right? And then eventually, if you continue to add that oversupply, what are you going to do to your factories? You're going to have to shut them down, right? You're going to have to shut them down. Then people are out of jobs. People can't afford these products or these goods. So what happens to the Dawes and Young plan? Eventually, once the United States is not receiving this money back, well, it is going to have oil. Great Depression hits. And not only does it hit the United States, it hits worldwide. 
right? So this tumbles the whole world into an economic depression, not just the United States. So you guys will mention more of that in American history too, later down the road. But again, for a short time, it looked like things were going great for Germany. Okay, they're actually seeing some prosperous times under this Gauls and Young plan, and also with Stressman as their leader through this. But one thing to note, right before the stock market crash in the United States in, 19, in 1929, guess you guys, just a month before, Stressman, oh, geez. So you can see how Germany's going to be looking for someone, a leader, to get them through these tough times of a depression. And that's where we see dictatorships rise. That's where we see people of extreme values take roles where they probably shouldn't. One guy we know is Hitler, right? Okay, all right. So with the Kellogg Brand Act, another thing it does is that it allows Germany to have a seat at the table, but at the same time, it also eliminates the idea of war ever again for Europe. Okay, so just 10 years after this pact was signed, okay, we know that Europe goes into another war. Hitler's not going to listen to what this pact has to say. But again, after World War I, maybe if Stressman was still around, right, if he didn't die in 1929, who knows where Germany would be? Who knows if there would be another world war, right? Chances are we'd have diplomacy. Chances are we'd have talks amongst these European powers. And obviously the United States is kind of joining in a little bit more. And maybe World War II would have been avoided. All right. Okay. Is there any questions? All right. So we're going to talk about hyperinflation a little bit more tomorrow. But, oh, geez. Here we go, Parker. You know it. Yes. Yes. Your assignment. Which I'm going to stop here, actually.